begin 4 o'clock at 9 news with Colorado's Department of Public Health and Environment releasing a new public health order today requiring workers to wear non-medical masks and gloves while at work. Now the order applies to people working in critical businesses and performing critical government functions. Well that includes banks, child care facilities, pharmacies and grocery stores. That order is in effect until at least May 17th. Everyone in Colorado, of course, is being encouraged to wear a non-medical cloth face covering when out in public. Well, then you have the three R's, reduce, reuse, and reappropriate. That's one way that FEMA is addressing a shortage of personal protective equipment. As of today, Colorado has a site dedicated to disinfecting PPE for reuse by healthcare workers who are on the front lines. Allie Levine and Byron Reed now give us a look inside. Let's be honest. Government isn't known for quick work. People often joke about red tape and government working slowly. But here at the Riverdale Regional Park, things are moving at warp speed. Monday, this was an empty fairground. By early next week, FEMA will disinfect up to 80,000 pieces of personal protective equipment here every day. So when something as critical as this comes up, Everyone put things aside and made sure that we addressed it right away. The lease was hammered out right away. And we also have worked with them to make sure that our building is up to specs. The first of seven trailers arrived on site this morning. A forklift moves each one into the exhibit hall. And inside each of these self-contained trailers, they'll be able to clean PPE, mostly masks, some face shields. They're sprayed with hydrogen peroxide mist before FEMA redistributes them to healthcare workers. The state says a single respirator can be reused up to 20 times. We are still at the height of this, and there's a potentially a second wave. So having an operation like this will benefit our local healthcare providers and keeping them safe is really the most important thing we can do. Senior Vice President of the Colorado Hospital Association, Julie Lomberg, calls the PPE supply chain interrupted and unreliable. She says, quote, anything we do right now to help ensure a long-term supply of hospital-grade PPE is critical. Allie Levine, 9 News. Colorado has been approved for a second system as well. The state is working to secure another location, and Julie Lonborg says the program could be especially useful for small rural hospitals in Colorado. We turn now to the massive JBS meatpacking plant in Greeley, which is set as of now to reopen tomorrow. That's the facility that closed a week ago on April 16th due to a COVID-19 outbreak among its roughly 4,000 employees. Four workers have died. Many more were infected. The company says starting tomorrow, workers will be screened as they arrive each day. They'll have their temperature checked and then be required to wear a mask at all times on company property. On site, COVID-19 testing will be available for symptomatic employees. And according to the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, more than 67,000 additional people filed for unemployment in Colorado last week. That brings the total number of new applications for the last month to just more than 279,000. Keep in mind though, it is more because people who are self-employed gig workers were not previously able to collect unemployment benefits. They were only allowed to start filing their claims on Monday and they're not included in this latest official count. About 51,000 people have already filed for benefits under that application. The impact of COVID-19 is being felt from Wall Street to the Plains, to Haxton, Colorado, where the work goes on despite the pandemic. Nine News reporter Noel Brennan and Ann Herps take us to Haxton, where they found out how life has changed and how it's also stayed the same. We're at home for us. It's Haxton, Colorado, in the northeastern corner. This is what we get to wake up to every day. Long before we tried to make the curve flat like the plains, Just building fence. work was remote and social distancing a way of life for Kyle McConnell. We're pretty good at it. We've been practicing for years. <laughs> His family's farmed this land since the late 1800s. You think about how it used to be, what the landscape used to look like, what they had to deal with. Today, the McConnells rely on corn and wheat, selling seed, and caring for cows. Well, if we didn't love it, we wouldn't do it, that's for sure. The family plans for ups and downs, dependent on the weather. It's either going to be wind, hail, rain, 
tornadoes, but not even a farmer prepared for a pandemic. Total revenue is down 30, 40 percent. All crops vary, but all crops are down. Cattle are down, hogs are down, poultry's down. The price of corn is so low, it's hard to justify planting. For lack of better terms, if you had a $200,000 house, you'd be selling it for roughly about $75,000. Anytime that you get into a financial situation, it threatens the, our way of life. But a farmer's optimism is rooted four generations deep. Look at the conveniences that we have at our disposal now versus then. I'd much rather do it now. This is nothing in comparison, I don't think, to what they went through. We just have to kickstart and jumpstart and get going and get back to where we were. COVID-19 won't keep Kyle from passing on this way of life. How can we maintain this for another three, five, 10, 20 generations? Working from home is how a farmer makes his living. It's a great lifestyle, but in general, it's a great life. Noel Brennan, Nine News. The CARES Act sets aside $23 billion to help farmers and ranchers. Kyle McDonald says he has also applied for a PPP loan for through the Small Business Administration. He hasn't heard back yet. Well, it's Thursday afternoon. We're closing in on the weekend. Here's a reminder that most Denver parks remain open, but with some new guidelines and restrictions. Then there's this. Denver Parks and Rec today issued a temporary directive banning the possession and consumption of beer, wine, and champagne in the parks and other public spaces. That temporary directive goes into effect tomorrow and is set to last through July 23rd. The idea is to encourage social distancing. Possession and consumption of hard liquor in parks and other public spaces is always prohibited. Some scattered storms expected today. More coming over the next two days. Temperatures have come down a little bit today as well, but Kathy Sabin joins us now. Mid 60s right now. Pretty nice. Oh, it's very nice and isolated non severe storms. We'll take that on an April afternoon. Outside we go and we have beautiful blue skies over Denver. A few cumulus clouds uh, hovering in the distance. We're 67 at DIA now 52 in Evergreen and 49 up in Granby. Comfortable and relatively quiet out there. Not a lot of wind. A few light snow showers over the higher terrain with the winter weather advisory that goes out for our northern mountains this evening through tomorrow. A little bit of thunder snow shown up around Craig Meeker outside of Aspen and Vail, and we'll see a little round of heavier snow west of Cheyenne up in southeastern Wyoming. No advisories for Denver, but with the arrival of the overnight cool front, we do have scattered rain showers coming overnight tonight and a cooler Friday, but it is Friday coming up and temperatures are not exactly going to be cold. Remember last week we had two snowstorms, so 50s with rain showers, uh, pretty easy in comparison to that. We have a northwest flow that'll drive a little weather disturbance through this afternoon, a cold front through later on tonight, snow in the high country and again some pockets of rain up around Ford Morgan and Greeley by the time we move through the early morning hours of Friday. And then we go partly sunny in the afternoon. Mid 60s now temperatures will drop only slightly after sunset and the showers will come in late tonight overnight, but will be a part of our forecast on Friday. Isolated evening storms give way to a cooler day on Friday, but that warmer weekend outlook with temperatures you're going to love. Uh, Tom, we've got some warm weather temperatures in my planning forecast we haven't seen in a while. I haven't seen them in a while. I know. So I look forward to seeing them in a few minutes. We'll see you then. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> The pandemic is having a broad impact on education. Besides students finishing their spring semester at home, the college application process has changed. Many schools are temporarily not requiring SAT or ACT scores for applications. Cornell University is the first Ivy League institution to join those schools. Cornell announced on its website that applicants for fall of 2021 can submit applications without those results. But the school says this is an exception, not a permanent change. So members of the House had to take turns as they voted today, all part of social distancing. They were voting on a half trillion dollar emergency aid package to help people. They realized that the economy is suffering, as are the highlighting of the numbers of unemployment and those that are un unemployed right now. Alice Barr has much more from Washington. A sobering sight on the House floor today, lawmakers in masks and gloves rotating through in groups to vote on nearly $500 billion in emergency aid, for some a deeply personal vote. 
my dear sister, who is dying in a hospital in St. Louis, Missouri right now, infected by the coronavirus. The latest coronavirus relief bill includes more than $300 billion to replenish the Small Business Paycheck Protection Program, plus $75 billion for hospitals and $25 billion for testing. Finally, help is on the way. The lifeline from Washington coming as new unemployment numbers out today show another gut punch to the economy. 4.4 million Americans filed first-time jobless claims last week, bringing the five-week total to more than 26 million new claims since the crisis began. The latest funding bill does not include money for cash-strapped state and local governments that are fighting the virus and fighting to pay their employees at the same time. We could be looking at teachers, police and firefighters being laid off as well. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell saying he's in favor of letting states file for bankruptcy protections. There's no good reason for it not to be available. New York's governor declaring the bankruptcy idea politically motivated and reckless. You want to see that market th fall through the cellar? Let New York State declare bankruptcy. A worrying prognosis for the health of the economy, made more uncertain by fears coronavirus will come back in a second wave later this year. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. And there is already talk about a new funding bill that may be needed. The White House is talking about funding infrastructure and a possible payroll tax cut. However, the Democrats are saying more states need money, and they're also considering other priorities like rent assistance. Coming up, we have much more from the Colorado Department of Corrections, where they're expecting a significant jump in COVID-19 cases among inmates in a prison in Sterling.
The latest data on Colorado COVID-19 cases is just in, and it shows the largest one-day jump in deaths. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment says that's partly because epidemiologists have begun to review death certificates for previously unreported COVID-19 cases. The new death toll has jumped to 552. That's 44 more than yesterday. According to the Colorado Hospital Association, 873 people are currently hospitalized, with 77 having been discharged or transferred within the last 24 hours. The total number of COVID cases in Colorado now stands at 11,262, that too an increase of 384 since yesterday. Colorado's Department of Corrections expects to see a noticeable increase in the number of COVID-19 cases at the prison in Sterling sometime soon. That's because yesterday they conducted more widespread testing there after eight inmates tested positive. Some of those inmates, uh, the patients, were asymptomatic. DOC health officials have been conducting detailed contact tracing investigations and inmates have been on quarantine in their cells since April 14th. Uh, this is a cold case that goes back nearly 60 years. 16-year-old Peggy Beck was murdered and her case remained unsolved until now. Nine News reporter Nelson Garcia shares the information shared by Jefferson County investigators who say this is the oldest cold case solved in the world with DNA technology. Though time in the form of 56 years has passed, Peggy Beck was never forgotten by Jefferson County Sheriff Jeff Schrader. At the age of 16, she was very excited when she got the opportunity to go to the Mile High Girl Scout Counselors Camp because it was the first time that she was going as a counselor. Beck lived in Edgewater, the oldest of four sisters. The camp was in the mountains west of Deckers, and it was her last night. She was raped and murdered in her tent in August of 1963. For years, different suspects emerged, were questioned, and were all released. Today, investigator Elias Alberti announced an arrest warrant for a man named James Raymond Taylor. We have spent several months searching for James Taylor with um, no luck. We have no idea where he's at. Or even if he's still alive. He, too, used to live in Edgewater and would be 80 years old right now. James was last seen in the Las Vegas area in 1976. The link was made by evidence preserved from the scene and the development of new technology. And this is the oldest suspect that's been identified through this methodology. Mitch Morrissey is a former district attorney and now the CEO of United Data Connect, who used DNA evidence to find a genealogical trail that led to a match with Taylor. No other case this old has been solved. In the world. Now, after nearly 60 years, Beck may finally have justice. Two of her three sisters are still alive and her family released a statement read by the sheriff. Peggy was a beautiful young girl who loved life. She was loving and protective of her family and we will cherish the memories we have of her forever. Never forgotten. In Jefferson County, Nelson Garcia, Nine News. If you have any information about James Taylor or what might have happened to him, you are asked to call the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. Clinical trials begin on a potential COVID-19 vaccine and mass production of what could be more testing are finished as well. That's next.
Scientists in Britain today began clinical trials on a potential COVID-19 vaccine. A team at Oxford University is working with a team in the United States, a U.S. company, and others to start producing large amounts of the potential vaccine, this even before the tests are complete. NBC's Kira Simmons explains more. Human trials are beginning for this potential vaccination from the University of Oxford here in the UK. In normal times, reaching this stage would take years, and I'm very proud of the work taken so far. There are around 80 possible vaccinations being worked on around the world, including in Asia, there in the US, and here in Europe. Now, those behind this particular vaccination in the UK are very, very hopeful for it. They say that they are 80% hopeful. That's partly because they've already worked on vaccinations for Ebola. The genetic code from the new coronavirus was discovered um, in uh, January of this year, and it was possible to go back to that genetic code and make these new vaccines very rapidly. Another aspect, they've actually got manufacturers, including in the US, producing this vaccination even while they're testing it all of that may have to just be shredded, dumped, if it turns out not to work. But if it does work, they think they can have a million vaccinations by September. Others are far more cautious, some suggesting vaccinations could take two years. Keir Simmons, NBC News, London. We want to let you know that the coronavirus task force press conference is going on at the White House. President Trump has been at the podium at times. If you want to watch that, you can uh, get a look at that over at 9news.com. We're carrying it for you live. Of course, hospitals are so busy during the pandemic and fear of catching the COVID-19 infection, well, that has many Americans staying away from hospitals, even if they have urgent health concerns. So here to talk about when not to delay care under any circumstances, as well as how certain atypical COVID presentations may require urgent care, is our nine health expert, Dr. Pyle Coley. So, Pyle, let's start with atypical presentations. What are we talking about there? So, Tom, this is a respiratory virus. And normally with respiratory viruses, you get symptoms in the lungs and systemic symptoms. So things like shortness of breath, cough, uh, fever, loss of appetite, malaise, muscle aches. These are the types of things we see with, with viruses like the flu. Now, this virus can certainly have those typical symptoms or the, the symptoms that are what you usually see, and that's the most common. But we've also learned that it can have a lot of atypical symptoms. So let me give you some examples. We've heard about loss of taste and smell as one of the atypical symptoms for what you know, might be a presentation of this virus. But there was a girl in, in Michigan who just presented with headache, and she ended up having encephalitis, which is actually inflammation of the brain. There's also been case reports of people presenting with what's called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an ascending paralysis. So starting from the feet upwards, you start to lose control of your muscles, first in your legs and then up in your arms. And that can also be an atypical presentation of this virus. So, you know, what we're seeing is that it can present in a number of different ways. And when we were in medical school, we were always taught that when you hear hoofs, you think about horses, not zebras. But when it comes to this virus, you think about both horses and zebras. So the message to really kind of put in the back of your mind out there, atypical symptoms can be uncommon, but really anything should set off alarm bells during this pandemic that it could be a presentation of the virus. Be aware, keep your mind open. We've been talking about urgent conditions and people not going to the hospital. So we've talked about things like heart attack and stroke. What, what are the urgent conditions that you don't want to postpone a visit to the hospital because you're afraid of possibly seeing or contracting COVID? Yeah, those are big ones. So what we're seeing is a huge drop in heart attacks coming to the hospital, huge drop in strokes. We're seeing people not filling their prescriptions for diabetes at the pharmacy, yet they're not showing up at the hospital. We're seeing less pregnant women coming to the hospital than before. And we know that this is not because these people are not getting sick, but actually because they're trying to avoid the hospital. So I really want to reassure everybody that you know, as much as we say try to avoid elective procedures and reasons to go to the hospital, it is safe to go to a hospital right now if you have something urgent going on. And urgent things to think about could present with symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath, fainting, severe headache, 
uh, you know, stroke type symptoms like losing strength. So if any of those types of things are happening, please don't delay going to the hospital because you're going to turn a small problem into a big one by not getting care right away. So, so is there advice then for high risk groups or seniors about about how to manage this if they do have these type of uh, those feelings that they're going they they really should be getting medical help? You know, I'm glad you asked me about seniors because we're learning more recently as well, uh, based on some anecdotal case reports that have come out, that seniors can also have those very atypical presentations, and their atypical presentations are actually different. So seniors have a different immune response to infections. They can also have problems like dementia, memory problems, prior stroke, all of these these things can complicate their ability to report the symptoms and to feel them. So some seniors that are presenting with COVID are actually just having very subtle symptoms like having less energy, lack of appetite, falling, sleeping more than usual. So if you have a senior in your house, you need to keep those radars up and really look out for any change in behavior because that could actually suggest a COVID infection. Yeah, and time is always of the essence. What about for younger people though? Uh, Obviously, one of the problems when we talk about younger people is it seems like they have that uh, that younger people disease, I call it, that idea that you are uh, bulletproof, <laughs> that nothing can get you. Yes, they do have that very commonly. And it's actually the opposite problem with younger people. So they can actually present with strokes as their first symptom. Wow. This is a case series that just came out of Mount Sinai yesterday that showed that five people presented with strokes all under the age of 50 and that COVID can actually increase your risk as a young person of having a stroke by sevenfold. And two out of five of these young people didn't even know they were having strokes and delayed presenting to the hospital. So definitely keep that in mind. The younger person disease is a phenomena that you don't want to succumb to for sure. All right, Dr. Coley, it's always good to talk with you. Thanks again for our visit today. Well, storms are in the forecast for today and the next few days, and Kathy will tell us all about it next.
about 4.30, take a live look at Greeley, and you can see a lot of blue skies, some puffy clouds, mid-60s. That's all pretty nice, but Kathy joins us now talking about some of those storms, and things look a little bumpy the next couple days. Yeah, Tom, we've got a cold front coming in tonight and another little weather system coming in 24 hours from now, but by the time we hit the weekend, it's going to look amazing. So a little moisture this time of year, we'll take it, and it's not snow for a change. Outside, you shared that beautiful view off to the west. Well, now we're going to look off to the east with clear skies and a few cumulus clouds dotting the horizon. Temperatures today running just a smidge above average. We're 67 this hour. We'll drop 10 degrees by 8 o'clock and welcome in some rain showers by 9. Should be a nice sunset tonight. Live look at Fort Collins there. A few light snow showers showing up on radar over the Continental Divide, where temperatures today have been in the 50s. A lot of snow melt. Almost 70 in Grand Junction, 67 the high in Denver, almost 80 in Springfield this afternoon. And it is calm and quiet across our fair city tonight, with DIA reporting 67 degrees. Winds are picking up in the backyard out of the west a little bit. Not bad, though. Mid-60s downtown. And the little weather maker heading our way is coming in from from the northwest. This dominant northwest flow will produce a little weather system that will cross the state late tonight. And there's an associated cold front with it that will come through overnight, ushering in some cooler air for tomorrow. Right now we're seeing some scattered snow showers over the northern mountains. There's a winter weather advisory this area in light blue that will go out tonight through noon tomorrow for about four to eight inches of snow. Up in southeastern Wyoming, advisories for heavy snow with a winter storm warning for some areas west of Cheyenne. We see this moisture you're coming in in the form of rain initially hitting some of those higher peaks and then we've got a bit of thunder snow this afternoon. A lot of the moisture not making it onto the plains, but we put an isolated shower in this afternoon and early part of the evening. Once the weather system moves through tonight and the cold front comes through, we have a better chance of showers and tomorrow the focus for stronger storms will be well east of us. Wichita down toward the New Orleans area back into Dallas and Houston. Yeah, we've got a little bit of rain coming in, but we're not expecting severe weather. It's a fast progressive system that will be well east of us by this time tomorrow night. We have a little more moisture upstream, but a lot of it will follow the jet into the Midwest. Temperatures tomorrow will be the coolest of the numbers we've shared with you all week. Mid 50s here in the city, the heat pushing into the southern plain states and Midwestern temperatures on the cool side. But look at the heat building across the western US. LA at 9195 in Phoenix tomorrow. So northwest flow brings an isolated thunder shower tonight, a little foothill rain and snow and then later tonight we start to see that northerly wind push in that front and we've got some scattered light showers that will be back with us again tomorrow afternoon with a couple of thunderstorms as well. So a bit cooler Friday and unsettled with a hit and miss shower or thunderstorm both tonight and tomorrow and you go up in elevation up over the higher terrain you'll run into a little bit of snow in areas like Winter Park and Georgetown and Granby but the winter weather advisories are out for areas really basically above 9000 feet for four to eight inches of snow and Again, that's 9 o'clock tonight through about noon tomorrow. So looking at lows for tonight, mid-30s, low-40s, common for much of the front range and eastern plains. Temperatures a little cooler in the high country. Certainly had a lot of snow melt in the Colorado high country this week due to the unusually warm weather from many areas. We'll see 65 in Grand Junction tomorrow, 44 in Eagle, 58 in Sawatch, 61 in Alamosa, mid-50s in Denver, some 60s in southeastern Colorado. Front range foothill temperatures will be in the 50s. Boulder will come in in the mid 50s as well, and we've got mid 40s for areas like Estes Park and for Grand Lake. So tonight, a stray shower possible as clouds increase along with the wind. Uh, maybe a rumble of thunder out on the eastern plains with our low at 39. Tomorrow, a mix of clouds and sun. We'll call it partly cloudy, mid 50s expected, with a shower or thunderstorm late in the day into the evening. It is Friday, and we are heading into a nice weekend. Get ready for this. We have sunshine and 63 Saturday, maybe an afternoon thunder shower, kind of like what we saw yesterday, a little bit of that foothill convection. Mid 70s Sunday, upper 70s. 70s Monday, mid 70s Tuesday and Wednesday, and we've got 80s on the map for the middle to end of next week. So that's not spring like that's almost summer like. I love how you all are sharing what your kids are doing out there making a difference. Erin Jordan sending this picture of her daughter Michaela. So many of you doing the chalk art, but this time Lori and Jim took it to the trees for signs of hope and inspiration for our frontline workers, firemen, police women, and we just so appreciate all of you. So keep those pictures coming. Let us know how you're doing and and you know what? We got a couple of nice days coming up after tomorrow. So I don't know, Tom, maybe the lawn needs mowing. 
I, I, actually, I was just noticing that, that it is going to be time to heat up the lawnmower again. <laughs> I think again. so. We shall see. Yeah, or looks buy like, a goat. Looks like April is going to wrap up with very nice weather. Looking forward to it. You know, for our second snowiest month, we'll take it. All right. Thanks, And Kathy. let me know if you want to buy a goat. i got some people you can talk to. I will. Okay. Thanks, Kath. <laughs> She's got goat people. Okay, weather stations across the country, they've kind of seen a decline over the last couple of decades, and that's been because there's been a lack of federal funding. That's why individual states have looked at their own networks and tried to make some improvements. Meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen looks at what Colorado's weather stations are like. It takes a lot of work and money to keep a weather station functioning properly. And many have been disappearing over the last couple of decades. And what has happened in the meantime is that individual states have realized how important it is to measure weather um, specific to the needs of the state. Assistant state climatologist Becky Bollinger says that many states have been gradually building up their own networks of weather stations called mesonets. Now Colorado is in the game and our mesonet is called Coagment. Coagment is a network of 85 weather stations located in nearly every county across Colorado. It's owned and operated by the Colorado Climate Center so they can assure that every sensor is equal and functioning properly. Temperature and relative humidity sensor inside of a solar radiation shield. The Coagmet manager was able to service a few stations just before the COVID outbreak, and they just unveiled a new website with each station having its own page. Bollinger says the process of building this network has been gradual. Some stations are in their first year of operation, while others have been gathering Colorado weather data since 1992. The longer the records are, and the more stations we have with those long records, the more useful they'll be for a variety of purposes, including prediction and drought monitoring and climate assessment, and still even on that short-term weather assessment that the, the farmers are looking for. Meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen, Nine News. The weather stations measure every type of weather except snow, which is an issue in Colorado. So there's a plan for that because actually the automated snowfall sensors, they're really expensive, but the state does plan to add those and that'll be one of the features they'll add to those weather stations.